Welcome to FM Evolution. I am your host, Sean Black. And today I'm so excited and a little nervous because I was joined, I'm John, uh, joined by John Bolin, who is a CEO in IO2 Visionary Advisor, Mentor, and Change Catalyst at InTouch. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. That's a, that's a mouthful. Well, that right? was a lot. That's, <laughs> no, I was, so, I was impressed with, uh, we had met earlier, I was impressed with what you guys are doing and, and uh, so excited to get to talk to you um, for today. So, uh, but kind of as a way of getting to know everyone, I ask everyone what they're reading because, you know, leaders are readers. And so I wanted to kind of get an idea of what you're reading, John. You know, that's a, that's a great question. I love that about this show. Um, I'm actually currently reading a book called Extreme Ownership by oh. Dr. Wilmink and yes. uh, Leif Babin. Uh, it sounds like you know the book. They led SEAL Team 3 in Iraq. Yeah. Uh, for those of your audience that doesn't know it, that included Chris Kyle, the American sniper. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when they returned from Iraq, uh, they actually crafted the curriculum to teach leadership skills to the Navy SEALs based on their successes and failures uh, during the war. Uh, and then they've applied that to uh, not just the military, but to business and, and broader life. Uh, I would say that in addition, I would be remiss if I didn't mention a book that I most recently finished, uh, which is in quite juxtaposition to this one, which was uh, How to Be Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. Oh, interesting. Um, so so uh, on June Juneteenth, like many of uh, my peer companies and some, some many large companies, we yeah. really challenged ourselves to learn more about what racism in America is really about and to educate ourselves. And I chose how to read the book. Uh, I chose how to be anti-racist. And um, it really changed my perspective on racism in the United States and really my responsibility as a 50 year old white guy yeah. to be part of the solution um, because our, our friends of color can't fix this on their own. Yep. It's going to take a lot of 50 year old white guys to, to help fix it. So I, I thought it'd be, you know, good for the audience. If you want to really know about me, um, extreme ownership really goes right down um, the lane for who I am and how I lead my business, but how to, how to be an anti-racist also shows, I think, how we can all grow. I love that. Those are uh, really, really good recommendations. We'll put those on the show notes because I've, I have read uh, Extreme Ownership, great book, uh, super powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, we practice that here at, you know, at CGB. And, and it's just one of those things where you can't go wrong with it, man. You no. own, every, every own every step of the process that you can. It's yours. Take care of it. Uh, it's just, it's a great philosophy. And uh, the other book I haven't read, I'm going to dig into that. That's a great recommendation. Well, I hope, hope you enjoy it. I read it in a single day, right? I read it on Juneteenth this year and, and that was my goal. So I read it cover to cover um, uh, one Friday. Nice. Well, with ownership comes leadership and we have been in a, in a crazy time. Mm -hmm. And I know you've talked a little bit about it before and during COVID and what's going on, but leadership um, you know, I had a podcast with our CEO and, and one of the things he said is the leaders are going to show up. They're going to show right. up during COVID. And so I kind of want to talk to you guys about your leadership during COVID and, and, and the times we're in. No, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, what's interesting is, you know, and I've shared this story a couple of times, uh, you know, when the world came to a stop in March, uh, myself and my CFO, we began sort of the urgent nature of replanning the business, right? We've yeah. heard so many of your, your guests talk about, you know, getting furloughed and what the impact was on them and how it changed their lives. Um, we were very fortunate that with a whole lot of good planning and a fantastic team, we were able to navigate, call it, you know, through the first 90 to 120 days without having to furlough any of our employees. We in fact invested on the dip, which is a, a, a phrase I coined during this process. Yeah. And there was just a tremendous amount of adrenaline um, during those first 60 to 90 days. And at some point over the summer, after talking to a lot of people, and you, I kept hearing, not my team, but, but folks in the industry, peers of mine in business, kind of talking about being a victim of the pandemic, right? I just can't wait till this is over. I just, yeah. I mean, this yeah. is really inconvenient. Um, you know, I, I really want to get back to running my company again, but I really need to get till, wait till it's over. 
And, uh, and it, it caused me to think, and this is, you know, I've, I've shared this story way too many times, Sean, um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cyclist and I'm, I'm not built like a cyclist, but my wife and I explore all kinds of crazy roads. We, we, we love cycling down country roads, although this, this weekend she hauled my butt all over North Texas and just said, hey, let's turn right up here. Let's turn left up here. Um, and, you know, 40 miles later, uh, we've, we've explored a whole new route. And, and you just don't know what's around every corner. And what's interesting is typically when we do that, we finish that particular challenge and we think, man, that was so much fun. That was one of my most favorite rides. It wasn't the same thing over and over again. And I didn't know what was around the next corner. I didn't know if it was a big hill that was just going to make my very large, you know, uh, job. <laughs> I'll put it that way, harder. And, and so as I reflected on that and I reflect on how cycling has impacted my life, I started to think about how we approach what goes on professionally and in particular, the pandemic. And I actually had a friend call me as I was kind of going through these motions and he said, man, how are you doing? I said, well, we got this going on, we got this going on. He's like, wow, that must be a beat down. And I said, hmm. honestly, I'm content. And I said, I'm not happy, I'm not thrilled, but I'm content because I'm the guy leading. Yeah. And I'm being challenged every day to see what I can do to impact the lives of my customers and my employees. And to really, you know, if you think about some of the concepts in extreme ownership, right? It's win or lose, man. That's right? it. And, and it, for, for me, the test is everything. And so I, you know, what I would tell folks about how I've approached it, right, is the adrenaline rush in the first six weeks, then you start to kind of get that lull and then the recognition that this is the time we're being called to be leaders. It, this environment isn't going away, right? There is no, oh golly, I just can't wait till it's done, right? This is it for a while. And our customers, especially in, in my portfolio, these multi, large multi-site operators, restaurateurs, retailers, hospitality service, right? their businesses have been dramatically impacted and will be so for a while. So it's mm -hmm. our job to help them through that, not sit on the sidelines with other people waiting for it to be over. Mm. I love that. That is just, that is the challenge right now. And like you said, leaders are going to show up. And if you're, uh, if you're sitting, sitting around waiting for the good old days to come back. Oh, and, you're, and so many you're, people you're do. just, you know, you're just, you're, it's passing you by. That's right. It is, That's it exactly is passing right. you by. Well, that's really interesting. I love the take on that. Um, I think a lot of people are in a position where they either innovate or die right now. And, exactly. And, and I, well, of course, a lot of our uh, core clients, restaurants and hospitality, I mean, they have been um, either devastated or they've really shifted things and mm -hmm. they're okay. Like, they're, like right. I would say they're content, right? Not happy, mm -hmm. but content. Right. And, and I love the challenges that come with that. And really great leaders rise up to face those challenges. So I, I love that. It's a great point. And I think it's a part of, I think it really comes down to part of the, the company culture and, and setting that stage for people. And um, so I kind of wanted to talk, you know, we've talked a lot about culture on this uh, show because it's such a big part of what makes a company, a company, you know, who they are and, and how they, they grow their, the people that work for them and, and, and how they innovate. And so I kind of want to learn a little bit more about InTouch's culture. Sure. And, and for me, Sean, it, it all rests on, on really one core principle, which is truth and transparency. Mm. And, and so we've got this incredibly innovative culture, but we ask our people to do a lot every single day. Yeah. And in a, in, a, in, a, in a company like ours, um, it's important for everybody to understand exactly what I think is going on, what my goals are, what I think success means, but most importantly, when I think it's hard, right? A lot of people talk about, you know, uh, leaders, you know, always having to be cheerleaders. Well, that's just not true at all, right? You can't always just paint some optimistic picture. Right? We are surrounded by wildly talented people. What they want are the, the facts so that they know how to manage them themselves. And so, you know, when I, when I deliver a presentation to the board, which I'll do later this week, uh, I actually, right after the board meeting, or at least as close in time as I can, I schedule an all-hands meeting, and I deliver the exact same deck to my entire company that I just delivered to the board. Nice. And, and if it's got fantastic news in it, 
everybody gets to high five. If it's got tough news in it, everybody has to swallow that and, and deal with it. But, but the core of what we do um, is based on truth and transparency. And, and, but what we're energized by is the technology and the impact that we can have outside of the organization, right? So, so for us, right, we're also driven by our, our core vision, which is, you know, we're here to improve the planet, improve our customers' profits, and we do it just one building at a time. Right? And that's sort of the rallying cry for everything we do. So I build my leadership style around truth and transparency. Um, we get energized by the fact that we're impacting a, uh, a broader um, uh, issue that impacts all Americans, which is climate change. And, and there's, we're just one small piece in, the, in, in a way that we can improve that. I love that. For those out there who maybe aren't familiar with InTouch, can you tell us a little bit about what you primarily do? Sure. I mean, you know, not to be uh, too flowery, but, you know, our, 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 <laughs> our job is to provide a healthier planet by delivering sustainability solutions that reduce energy, drive profitability, and, and really simplify facilities management for multi-site operators. You know, at, at its very core, what that means is we deliver uh, the best energy management solution in the market, bar none. We change the way facilities operators can manage their business by digitally enabling them. We digitally transform facilities management for our customers to make their job easier and to make their companies more profitable. Wow. That's outstanding. That's a great explanation of exactly what you guys do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gosh know, knows I should get it right, right, Sean? You better get it right. <laughs> that will be at the board meeting next week. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> No, no, that's great. Uh, I love that we are so much focused on innovation right now. And a big part of the of the show, of course, is talking about innovation and trends and, and really um, helping facility managers understand what's out there and, and how it impacts them. And we talked earlier about really about impacting people's lives. And I know right. that you're huge on that and, and how that, you know, rolls out for InTouch. Oh, absolutely right. I, I talked a little bit about climate change uh, a moment ago, but you know, if you think about it, um, buildings represent 30 36% of the energy consumed around the globe. Um, and they generate 39% of global car carbon emissions. In the United States, they consume 42% of our country's energy and 70% and of our country's coal. And they generate nearly half of the CO2 emissions in the US. And when we think about climate change, we're always thinking about cars and smokestacks and yeah. And, you know, all of the, the sort of dirty technologies, we never really wrap our heads around the idea that, that the offices we go to work in and the houses we live in are actually the largest culprit. And the simplest way to impact your energy consumption in a building is to make it smarter. Mm -hmm. In fact, McKinsey, McKinsey did a study that said the most efficient, highest return way to become more energy efficient in buildings is to put smart controls in place. Right? It has the best ROI and the fastest return to payback, which is obviously the core of what, what InTouch does. But more importantly, by doing this for our customers, our facilities managers, we're gonna digitally enable them and create more resilience in their business. It, you know, the pandemic has been this fast forward exercise and asking your business whether it was resilient. And, and a lot of folks found out the answer was resoundingly no. Yeah. Um, folks that were able, and if you go come down to where InTouch can impact, who had already digitally transformed facilities management, they were actually able to, to take on what, what they believe are mundane tasks, but are impossible tasks if you're not digitally enabled. For example, I need to change the schedules for every single one of my sites right now for tomorrow. I want to change the way I'm heating or cooling that space across every single site in my chain. And then a week later, when it all changes again, I actually need to just bring half of them back online. Um, and then the other half are gonna open partially. Right? We have fitness center customers who decided to change their operating schedules to open for an hour, close for an hour, open for an hour, close for an hour. Right? Without being able to reach out to those buildings digitally, right? you're, you're literally making phone calls, trying to get someone in to go in and change setbacks. Just, you know what, just, just turn them all on, turn all the fans on and push them all to cool and hopefully that'll work. The inability to digitally enable that has left some folks really defeated while other folks have really been able to move forward. That's the fast forward 
exercise that climate change is going to bring us over the next decade if we don't sort of get after it. Interesting. And, and so if you think about, you know, this being a dry run for a slow motion event, right? Imagine a decade of, of challenges in different environments. Now it will be, it won't come in the form of, hey, we're closing everything. It's going to come in the form of, you know, catastrophic weather events, right? Some of our, our listeners are probably managing fires on the West Coast right now as part yeah. of their facilities management strategy. I know we are with our customers automatically closing dampers to make sure that they we're able to manage the smoke. So climate change is going to create this long-term test on our resiliency, and it's going to take technologies like Entouch to enable the facilities teams to battle that. Um, and if, if we thought there was a litmus test over the last you know, six months, the litmus test over the next decade could be just as hard. Do you think that this pandemic is going to change the way people think about climate change now? I mean, it's just, I, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a big subject. There's a lot, of, right. a lot of companies out there, a lot of CEOs that obviously have to think about this because their footprint mm -hmm. is so vast. No, I think, I think, I think it might. I mean, my op the optimistic uh, part of me says it will. Um, there are a couple of things going on before the pandemic started. Most importantly, the idea that large financial institutions were acquiring the, the companies that they invested in to demonstrate real progress on ESG initiatives, so environmental, social, and governance initiatives. And in particular, we're scoring them. And um, essentially said, we will pull our investment if you don't start improving. So there was already a, um, a groundswell of this. And, and importantly, companies that score high on ESG metrics actually perform better, right? So that's why it, it, this isn't because it was altruistic on the part of these financial leaders. It was because those companies appeared to perform better. So there was already this groundswell. What I'm hopeful of is that it is true that in the early stages of the pandemic, um, people got to see clear skies in certain cities again and clear waters. You know, they, we talked about the water in Venice and the skies in China, uh, that, that it gave them a sense that they were understanding that there was a very human impact on their quality of, of life. The challenge is, will we take that learning and turn it into change? Because the idea that somehow 90 days or six months of pullback is somehow going to change the equation it's just a myth, right? It's a tiny little blip in the overall output of omissions, right? So, you know, most experts have said, yeah, we didn't buy ourselves any time at all it, unless we made these changes permanent. And yeah. so the optimist in me says, people now understand that human behavior matters and without doing a whole lot, we can make an impact. The pessimist in me worries that our memories are short and, you know, in six to 12 months, we'll, go right know, back to it. we'll be right back to where we were. So, so I, I, I'm hopeful um, that, that we'll understand that collectively we can move the needle, but it didn't take, you know, a bunch of multinational agreements or anything else for us to move the needle that hard, that fast. It took a bunch of people just changing their behavior. What should make us optimistic is that, especially in the United States, a lot of the remote work that drove down automobile driving and, and, and consumption of fossil fuels, that may be a permanent change, right? The Entouch team will never return back to our offices in the same way we did prior to the pandemic. Not because we can't, just because we think it's a better deal for the employees and for Entouch and our customers if our employees are more productive and can take advantage of a remote work environment. I think it's interesting the culture shift that is happening because of this pandemic. And I think you're right. I mean, obviously people like Facebook and, you know, Amazon, a lot of these companies are going, Hmm, we really don't need an office this big. Right. You know, and Hmm, this might be really a benefit to the team that, you know, that is working for us to have flexibility to, at the same time. I think, um, my personal opinion, we got to be careful because I know people who are working at home will continue to work at home. A lot of us will. Right. So you only end up doing 10 and 12 hours a day, which, hey, 
that's not a bad thing to me. I love work. So, <laughs> but you got to balance it out too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I joke that there's really only three days in a week now. There's weekday and then Saturday and Sunday. And weekday right, is just 120 hours of yeah. work and peppered in with some naps and some meals, right? I mean, it, it's, it's really um, become difficult to you know, think in terms of Tuesday and Thursday. When you, know, you get up, you commute across the house, and, you know, for me, right, I, I take um, two of my three meals a day at my desk. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, think about, you know, we all talk about um, times when we ate, ate lunch at our desk at the office. I yep. eat breakfast and lunch every day in the same spot. And, uh, and, and you just sort of, you know, you, you get up and you blur into work and then you sort of blur out. And so, so you have to do a lot of, you know, good mental health kinds of things, right? Whether it's fitness, right? I ride the bike. You know, you got to check out and walk the dog. You got to make sure you're spending more time with your family and not letting it intrude. I mean, there's a lot of things that that go into making sure you're being healthy. But um, you make a good point, right? Working from home has lots of advantages, but you've got to create boundaries. Uh, we we suspect when we return uh, to the office, like it'll likely be in January, uh, we're 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 going to create sort of modified. Uh, um, requirements for different teams to come in, right? So yeah. maybe a day a week, maybe two days a week, because the other thing you miss is uh, you miss the social interaction. Yeah. Oh my gosh, right? Yeah. I think I shared with you, Sean, I, I saw I, I saw my CFO in person for the first time in a while, uh, <laughs> a week ago Friday, and and he and I didn't want to leave. We're sitting in a parking lot talking after we'd uh, gone to a meeting, and it, the fact that it was a human being that didn't live in my house yeah. um, oh, made yeah. me want to keep talking. Yeah. And uh, cause I, I gotta be honest, my coworkers in this building, you know, um, I don't know that they enjoy me as much as they used to. And they have boundary issues. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. You know, the whole op open door policy, there's, there's gotta be, it's gonna be some boundaries with the work at home crowd. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. That's so interesting. Well, I'm really kind of interested to see what happens with this and, and, and how it's going to really impact the younger culture too. And, and, you know, of course, you know, we have kids and, and, and I'm really watching to make sure that they stay active and communicate with each other, but not just us, but with their friends and being able mm -hmm. to communicate and connect. And I think it, that applies to the office here too. As leaders, we're really going to have to focus on making sure that we still stay connected. And I yeah. think that's part of that leadership that we were talking about earlier. Oh, absolutely. And, and I would tell you that uh, my team, the, the senior team at, at NTouch meets every Friday, and we talk through these issues specifically, in particular morale and um, sort of social collaboration. And one of the things we're trying to, to find a way to do virtually, and we're worried that it's more challenging and you have to be very mindful of it, is the, um, the improp, impromptu collaboration around creative problem solving. Yeah, uh, we, you know, Touch's culture is very much an open environment, uh, something that may go the way of the dodo if you think about office space in the future, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, but it wasn't uncommon at all for one of us to hear a conversation on the other side of the room, kind of lean back, think, you know, I think I can add value to that, go over and it turns into two to three people jumping in front of a whiteboard and, and, and solving a problem that otherwise might not have gotten solved. And what we found in the pandemic working virtually is that um, some of those questions um, go unsaid. And so, you know, we're learning the social norms of, hey, it's okay to, if you're in teams, for example, to click that camera and add somebody in and just throw an impromptu virtual meeting together. Yeah. And, and what's funny is we see that as um, less polite than walking over to somebody's desk and saying, do you have a minute? But there's really no difference. We just, we just aren't, yet ready to click that button. We haven't broken that muscle memory. And so we've really got to work through that. That's something that NTouch is working on is really trying to create this, this collaboration uh, because we do feel like we miss that at times. And I, I think it slows creativity down. Um, I think for some of our other teams, it's absolutely sped, sped up their ability to get their work done and made them more productive. But I think as, and not just NTouch, I think all companies have to think through how do we create that really, really neat lightning in a bottle that you get when really smart people collaborate and do it virtually. No, that I think is, is absolutely going to be the key 
to getting out of this whole thing and really accelerating uh, our company's growth and, and, and impacting other people's lives is really staying focused on um, helping them and being uh, creative and trying to find new ways to do things. Absolutely. And I, I, you know, we're going to wrap up here a little bit, mm -hmm. but I want to talk about innovation with you guys because you definitely, you guys definitely are innovating in your space. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that with you. No, I, I appreciate that, Sean. And, and, you know, obviously for us, it's, you know, it's every day, right? That's, yeah. and when you deliver the solutions that we deliver, um, we have to be the vehicle through which our customers can innovate this part of their business. I talked a little bit about digitally transforming their business. And, and the way we do that is by applying the level best technologies that you can for the purpose with which, with which they're fit, right? So for example, you know, we are leveraging now uh, m machine learning algorithms mm. so that our customers can optimize how their buildings are cooled. And so essentially turn the building on, allow that building to cool. Um, and over time, based on what needs to be done and how the units operate, we will optimize how to get to a specific temperature and use the least amount of energy as possible without, without anybody playing with the, with the dials or, or levers, if you will. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, we're leveraging the same types of technologies as, as, uh, as our data tells us that, that there's, there's, uh, there might be something wrong. We actually leverage machine, algorithm, machine learning algorithms to identify whether that error is in fact, in fact true, right? Mm. Sometimes a sensor might, might pick up some information and it could be a false negative, right? We actually have an algorithm that we filter uh, that data through to ensure that we aren't pushing a false, uh, a false error to a human being to work. Uh, we've integrated with one of our technology partners at CMMS Solution uh, with one of our large customers where we are fully bi-directionally through the CMMS platform and the EMS platform automated from the moment uh, a employee at a site says I'm uncomfortable and creates a work order and that flows through the entire technical ecosystem lands on uh, our servers our servers actually validate whether the site is functioning correctly if the site's functioning correctly even if someone says they might be hot or cold we don't need to send a technician and so we can actually without a human being being involved validate that that site's infrastructure is functioning correctly and close the work order out and, and move it into a closed queue. If the site's actually got an existing alert or an existing exception, we can actually take that work order, append the information to it and move it right into a queue for dispatch wow. without a human being being involved in any of that. That's how you digitally transform what's going on and how, we, how we've chosen to innovate um, a space that, that really is, is yearning for innovation. That's amazing. I mean, talk about, that's crazy innovation. A uh, little AI going on there, and right. a little Absolutely. scary, but pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take over the world, man. Uh, well, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I'm excited for that. That's that's amazing. For those who are excited about this type of innovation and really want to learn more about In Touch, how do we find you guys? The uh, the easiest way is um, to reach out to me directly, John at ntouchcontrols.com, J O N dot B O L E N at ntouchcontrols.com. You can call me at 214 986 6903. Um, if you want to, you know, be a little bit more anonymous, you can always send a message to info at ntouchcontrols.com. <laughs> uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. Don't be scared, man. You guys reach out. <laughs> but Absolutely. just in case, yeah, just in case. Uh, John, thank you so much for sharing uh, about InTouch and your leadership and the culture there and the innovation that you guys are doing. I am super impressed with what's going on and I can't wait to see what happens next with your guys' company in the future here. You guys, I got an amazing team. I met multiple people on the team and uh, I can tell you what, I'm, I'm excited, excited to kind of see what what they can do here in the future, especially with the circumstances right now. Well, I, I appreciate that. You're too kind, but, uh, but the reality is we have a fantastic team and um, yeah. they're, they're the folks that let me spend time chatting with you. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't be where we are. That's it. All right, buddy. Thank you so much Thank you. Thank you for being on the show. We'll Absolutely. have to have you back and get an update sometime uh, next year. So what's going Absolutely. on after, after all this is done. <laughs> after, <laughs> after we go back to normal, right? When we're, when we're all just kind of breathing. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Whatever right, that is. Thank you. Take care.